Well, good morning, Emmanuel Fellowship. Isn't it a good morning to be in the house of God to come together and worship Him this morning? Amen? Amen. Why don't you stand with us this morning as we worship the King of kings and the Lord of lords? first, loving your name, giving you everything I am, lifting my voice, shouting your praise, living for everything you are. Sing that again. Seeking you first, loving your name, giving you everything I am. Lifting my voice, shouting your praise, living for everything you are. Every creature reaching for you, every breath now, sing it out loud. And yours is the kingdom, yours is the power, yours is the glory. will be in the back along with uh, Troy Coles. So if you have any uh, prayer needs that you would like for us to uh, uh, pray with you on, you know, please come back. There's also communion back there for uh, those of you who would like to uh, participate in communion this morning. Um, lots of things happening in our world, um, disasters of all kinds. Um, also, I can tell you in our own personal lives, there's always some challenges. And I have been doing a, uh, reading a book called Touching the Invisible by Norman Grubb. 
which was written like back in the 40s and then reprinted a few times. And sometimes I like kind of the old stuff because you find out what we think is our struggles, people have been struggling with for a long time. Um, and on the same side of things, the Lord's been there through all of it. And um, this week is one of those joyous chapters on adversity. And uh, too much information developed there here this morning, but there was a quote from there that um, I think is fairly profound and something you have to think on a bit. And in the next month's newsletter, I've been asked to, part, to participate in submitting something, and I probably will develop this a little more. But this is what he said. All forms of adversity, all experiences of what we call evil, shocks, suffering, difficulty, disasters, unjust treatments, are never the happenings in themselves, but the effect we allow them to have on us. No matter whether objectively an experience is apparently good or evil, subjectively, the one that fears and doubts, all is evil. The one who trusts, all is good. So this morning, Lord, we trust you because you're the trustworthy one. And we thank you for your presence here this morning. And we invite you um, this morning to speak to us through your servant, Mike. Lord, reveal to us what you would have us to know, to carry out of here, and to apply to our lives. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.
praise you, Lord. We praise you, Lord. Lord, that's what we have come to do today, to give you our very best. best. Lord, that every breath within us would praise you. Lord, that everything within us would give you honor and glory because you deserve it, Lord. You are holy. You are worthy. Lord, there is none like you. You are matchless. And so, Lord, we worship you today. Just in your own words, just tell him how great he is to you, that he is holy. You know, he's deserving of all of our praise, not just in a song, but a new song from our heart. So just in your own words, just tell him. Lord, we worship you this morning. We give you all we are. You are great, Lord. You are great, greatly to be praised.
So let all the earth proclaim, all the people sing, you are holy, you are holy. Let all the heavens ring, worthy is the King, you are holy, you are holy. Let all the earth proclaim, all the people sing, you are holy. says that the angels and the saints in heaven are around the throne of God saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And this morning as we worship, I want to sing this part again. All the earth proclaim, all the people sing that you are holy. We join in with the angels and all of heaven declaring that he is holy. And I can't help but think because of his holiness that they are on their knees before him. So as we sing this portion again, this bridge, let all the earth proclaim, all the people sing, you are holy. Maybe that's you today and you just need to bow on your knees and cry holy to him. 
and just recognize his greatness. He is greater than what we can imagine. He is greater than what we can grasp. He is more holy. And I do believe that when we get to heaven, we will see that in its fullness, his holiness. And we can't help ourselves but fall on our knees before him and cry, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. So as we do this this morning, as we sing this again, and maybe you just need to bow in your heart <clears throat> or on your knees this morning, just in this intimate moment, as we sing this song, as we declare his holiness, as we sing of his greatness. So let all the earth proclaim, all the people sing, you are holy. You are holy, and let all the heavens ring. Worthy is your word, Lord. You are holy. You are holy, and let all the earth proclaim. Let all the people sing. You are holy. Yes, you are. You are holy. but on you and your holiness, Lord, and your greatness. We sing, worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Blessing and honor and glory forever to you, Jesus. Blessing and honor forever to and I will show you my way. You must continue to seek my way. I am God, you are not. You are my children. I am the one that has all knowledge. Come to me, for I am love. Let me purge you and cleanse you from your sins. Let me rescue you daily from what it is that offends you, because that offends me. Come to me, my people. I love you. Hear my heart. Hear my heart. Thank you, Lord. Jesus. He that will not will never pass away. Praise the Lord from the earth, you great sea creatures and all ocean depths. Lightning and hail, snow and clouds, stormy winds that do his bidding. You mountains and hills, fruit trees and all cedars, wild animals and all cattle, small creatures and flying birds, kings of the earth and all nations. You princes and all rulers on earth, young men and women, old men and children. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His splendor is above all the earth and the heavens. And he raised up for his people a horn, the praise of all faithful servants of Israel, the people close to his heart. Praise the Lord. Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we want to see you have your way, Father. We want to see you continue to move in our lives personally. Lord, as we declare of your holiness, as we sing of your greatness, we just ask that you would have your way in our lives. Search us, Lord. Search us, Lord. I'm reminded of
Isaiah. And in the book of Isaiah, where it reads, where he sees the Lord, he says, I saw the Lord. And he said, woe is me, for I am unclean. Because he saw God's holiness. And then he saw his uncleanness next to God's holiness. But I love the portion that says, but then he cleansed my lips. And this morning, as we continue to worship, as we just take this moment, I just want to, I just want to do just that. Just take a moment before God and ask him, just personally where you're at, ask him, Father, what is it that's unclean in me? We see your holiness, Lord. Would you shine a light on that which is unholy in me? And would you cleanse me? Would you make me whole? Would you make me holy as you are holy? Let's just take a moment. Just quiet yourselves before him. Just search your hearts. Just in this moment.
is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. With all of creation I sing praise to the King of kings. You are my everything. says, I will praise the Lord at all times. I will constantly speak his praises. I will boast only in the Lord. Let all those who are helpless take heart. Come, let us tell the Lord's greatness. Let us exalt his name together. Father, this morning, in our praise, I pray, God, that your name was lifted high above all else. God, I pray that this service is yours. And God, above all else, again, your name be lifted high. God, your word says that if we lift you high, God, you would draw all men to yourself. And so, Lord, we give you all that praise and all that honor to put you above ourselves. And we would give you all the praise in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen, amen. amen. Well, before you are seated, why don't you share some of that love with your neighbor, Hug a few necks, shake a few hands.
you would make your way back to your seat, please. All right, all right, all right. Well, good morning, Emmanuel Fellowship. If you love the Lord, say yes. All right, if you would find your way back to your seat. If you are new in the house, you are a guest, you are part of our family. In the seat back in front of you, there is a yellow card uh, that has a little bit of information on it. If you would fill it out for us, in the back at our connection point, when you first walk in, that, that semicircle desk back there. We would love to exchange that for a small gift. There will be an elder back there as well if you have any questions uh, that you might have regarding the church or anything you'd like to ask. Uh, if you came in late, it's okay. I slept in a little bit this morning as well. Uh, and you have not checked in your kids or you didn't know to, uh, we're going to dismiss the kids now. Uh, if you would follow them back, uh, Miss Destiny will take them all kindergarten through fifth grade. You are dismissed, and as I said, if you have not checked your children in, please do so now at this time. Would you give it up for our kids? We love them. Yes. All right, and we've got a small announcement from one of our elders, Brother Troy Coles. If you would give it up for Brother Troy. Good morning. Good morning. Well, as an interlude, what I want to say, I mean, this is uh, Pastor Appreciation Month, uh, and so I just want to give a shout out to one of the things I loved about Pastor Mike when he was here was he was not afraid to call sin, sin. He was not afraid to confront the lies uh, that we face each day, and, and with Pastor Chris, we have another man of God who will call sin, sin, and unfortunately within the church today, uh, that is a rarity, so uh, I bless our pastors because uh, at this congregation, uh, what I appreciate is uh, we will call out sin, or our pastors will call out sin. What I'm here to share with you today is uh, I've been with Omaha for Decency. This is also Pornography Awareness Month, October is. Uh, I've been with Omaha for Decency for almost 25 years. In the last 22 years, I've taken a message of hope into public schools and into private schools on the issue of pornography. Here next weekend on Saturday, some, some information on the back. We will be having a presentation at the Omaha Westside Center. Uh, the FBI computer and forensic examiner, Jordan Warnock, will be our keynote speaker, as, long, as well as a, uh, an investigator from the Papillion Police Department addressing some of these issues. One of the biggest issues that we're facing today, what I call an epidemic, is sexting. Uh, I will just say this. I'm glad that when I was a teenager, this stuff was not available but it is widespread amongst our young people. And the surveys that we do in our private school systems alone, over 60% of our youth are already sexting. Uh, in, the, in the middle school group, over 40% of our youth are already sexting. And so this is gonna address some of these issues uh, with sexting and it also addresses a lot of the issues that Jordan faces as a forensic examiner. So we want to invite you. It is a free event. And uh, so, again, if you have any information, if you have more information, there's one of these flyers on the back. God bless you. Well, this morning, uh, as we prepare our tithes and our offerings and the ushers will come forth, uh, I'll pray. Father, we know that, that your word asks for our, the first 10% of our income. And so, Father, when we are faithful in that, Lord, your word says to test you, that you may pour out blessings upon us when we give. So, Lord, as we, as we prepare and we give uh, what you have asked of us, God, would you be faithful in that promise and giving back and returning to us uh, what it is that you've promised. So, Lord, bless the giver uh, in everything that they give, and may you receive all the glory for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you would turn your attention to the screen.
Good morning and welcome to Emmanuel Fellowship. My name is Chris and we're so glad that you picked today to be with us. We're believing when you leave, you will be encouraged and lifted in your walk with Christ. Get ready, we're about to dive into the Word, but before we do, got a few announcements for you. Just want to give a quick shout out and a big thank you to everybody that played a part in blessing Northwest on Friday night. Thank you so much for helping us in whatever part you played. It was a tremendous blessing for everybody, the band, the football team, the coaches. Just thank you so much. We're making a difference over there. Let's keep up the good work. If you're a guest with us today, or maybe you've been new around here for a little while, we want to invite you to come out to our Newcomers Dinner on Sunday, October 29th at 6 o'clock. This is a great night to get to know our church, who we are, where we've been, and where we're going. It's also a great night of food and fellowship with our pastors, our staff, and some of our elders. So again, we want to invite you to come out. You can sign up at our Connection Point or online. We hope to see you there. Christmas is in the air, and that means Operation Christmas Child. Now, this is a great ministry of taking the gospel of Jesus Christ literally around the world to children everywhere. Check out this video. Right now, in places all over the world, there are children who feel forgotten and alone, without a home, without a friend, and without hope. But what if love could arrive through a simple gift? When you pack a shoebox with Operation Christmas Child, you're giving much more than a gift. You're helping a child find a friend, experience the love of Jesus Christ, and discover their own potential. In the hands of a child, this small gift has a big future. You can see from the video, this is a huge, powerful ministry making a difference in the lives of children everywhere, and we, Emmanuel Fellowship, get to play a part. Listen, we got more information coming, but we do have an informational table in the back where you can get all the stuff you need. Come on, church, let's get behind this and bless some kids. That's all the announcements we have for you today. Of course, we got a lot of great things going on around church. You can find out all that information and more in your bulletin, or you can go to our website. Today, I'm super excited and honored to introduce our guest speaker, Pastor Mike Harris. He is the founding pastor of this church. Lisa and I are away for a few days, but I'm super excited for y'all to get the word this morning from Pastor Mike. So get ready, let's go there together. Have a great week in the Lord. It's a delight to be here again. We've been coming for several months, and but it's nice to be able to share. I just want to get a couple of things out of the way. First of all, I want to thank Pastor Chris for asking me to speak. I'm blessed by that, and I know um, you have been blessed by him since he's been here. A couple of quick things. We are asked, how are we enjoying retirement? We aren't. <laughs> retired. <laughs> We're enjoying it greatly. We have a lot of things going on. We're spending some time with some couples. We're doing some uh, discipleship with some people, and we're doing some premarital counseling. The interesting thing is I did three funerals in September, two, two marriages in July, so it's been a busy time. We were actually privileged to go to Haiti and speak. Sharon and I spoke to some leadership down there for a missions organization. I went to Nepal for nine days and spoke there, did some teaching there. And along the way, we were asked to write some devotions for a couple's devotional book, and some of those were actually published in a book called The Little God Time for Couples. So we have stayed busy, and we have enjoyed it. We are blessed to be able to do those things. One of the other things we've done is we visited, while we were away from here for about 10 months, we visited about 15 to 20 churches. And obviously, when you go visit churches, you're always thinking about where you were, you know, and so as we've processed that, Sharon said, I think you just need to reflect on a few things. So I'm going to reflect on a few things before we actually get into the Word today. One of those things is, how many are here who were here at the very beginnings? We started with about 75 people. If you were one of those 75, would you stand? Is there anybody left here? 
was a part of that? I want you to know these people are amazingly blessed because they put up with me and I, I am dumber than dirt when it came to starting a church. I didn't know anything. And they were kind, they were gracious, and they're very supportive, and I thank them for that. Which takes me to where we are today is we are blessed still with the leadership of this church. And I know Pastor Chris is as well. One of the things that I'm so blessed by is they have allowed us as the pastors me and then Pastor Chris and the other pastors to be, to be free to do, direct the service the way we feel that God is directing it. And I'll tell you what, that is freedom, dear ones, because that doesn't happen very often. In the churches we visited, it is clocked out minute by minute. They know exactly what's going to happen. And we are free because the leadership's permission to go where God has us to go. And we are blessed by that greatly. And I know Pastor Chris is. And I so appreciate, again, him giving me the opportunity to be here. But also, one of the things I, I have appreciated is the way God has moved among us sometimes. I just want to reflect on a couple of those things. You know, there have been times where I came prepared for a message. In the middle of worship, God said, you're not giving that message today. We're going somewhere else. Like, well, 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 okay, God, where are we going? <laughs> because, you know, you plan, you prepare. But when God says, go somewhere else, we have to go somewhere else. And we have done that on a number of occasions. I've been blessed when we have been able to stop in the middle of worship or stop in the middle of a message because God is putting on somebody's heart. And sometimes it's been elders coming up and saying, Brother Mike, I think God is taking us this way. And he does. And about 90% of the time we've done that. We felt like that was what God was saying. But there have been times where we've stopped in the middle of a message, stopped in worship, and ask people, if you're hurting today, if there's a need in your life, if you're depressed or hopeless, would you just stand where you are? And, people, and, and then I would ask the congregation, said, would you gather around them and pray? And you know what blessed my heart? 80 to 90% of the people who called this place church home would gather around them and pray. As a pastor, you don't know what that does because we're not going to church. We're being the church when those things happen. And... and and the body of Christ is being lifted up and encouraged because they're, they're sharing the gifts that they've been given. They're doing the one another's of Scripture. That's what church is really all about, okay? Or the time when, I mean, I don't remember where, where this came from, but I, I was preaching and just stopped the meal and said, I, I believe God wants people who are in need financially to go to the back of the room. And I'll tell you what, dear ones, it takes a lot of courage to admit that and to go to the back of the room. But a number of people went back there. And I said, let's take a couple of minutes to kind of, let's take a couple of minutes and pray. And I believe God wants us to bless them today. So I want you to pray and you ask the Lord how much you can give and who you should give it to back there. And we took time and did that in the middle of service. It, and I mean, I love the freedom that God has given the leadership here. It is a unique place like no other we've been. By the way, I think all those people who went back to back got about $1,000 each that day. We didn't take an offering. We had people go back and give it to them and pray with them and speak into their life. Okay? That's what I love about Emmanuel, the freedom that the elders, the leadership has given to the pastors to do what God is leading them to do. Or how many of you were here for the foot washing? You remember that day? That was an amazing day, wasn't it? I mean, it's a, it's a day that people remember. And I, me of little faith, we're preaching through the book of John, and in chapter 13, it talks about foot washing, and I'm meeting with some young people, I call them the creative team, and we would meet and talk about the passages and where we thought we should go, and I, I wasn't sure what to do with that, and I said, maybe I should just model and, and wash a couple of people's feet. And they're, no, no, we need to have a foot washing. I'm like, foot washing for 250 people? I, I don't have a clue what that looks like or how that works. But they said, I think we can do that. And they, put, they honestly put the whole thing together. All I did was show up that day. And God did an amazing thing. And when you have two teenage kids come up to you and say, would it be all right if I washed my dad's feet? Wow. Or you have a husband come. We had the men on one side, the women on the other. And a husband comes and say, I believe God wants me to wash my whole family's feet. Can I do that? Dear ones, 
Those are God moments. Those are things you can't make happen. Those are things that God interrupts our plans, and he does what he wants to do. And the leadership here allows that to take place. This is a place that's really blessed. Or one more time, one more thing, and I'm going longer than I intended to on this. We had a situation where we had to bring a missionary home from the field for, for something that shouldn't have happened. And it was a difficult time. That missionary, I, I so admire them. They could have bolted and ran, but they stayed at church. Didn't hang their head low. They just continued to grow in the Lord. They came to the elders one night. Elders me and said, you know, I need to ask for forgiveness and apologize. And so they did. And the elders, obviously, forgiveness had already been given, but to express it to that person and let them know they're forgiven. But then that person said, I need to share that with the whole congregation. And I said, you let me know when. And lo and behold, a lot happens during worship, you know. A person came up to me in worship and said, I think today's the day. When I said, let me know, I was thinking, give me a week or two in advance. <laughs> but God does a lot of suddenlies in our life, doesn't he? Came up to me and said, today's the day. I told the congregation, we're putting the service that we had on hold and here. And the person shared with the congregation, asked for forgiveness. And the extraordinary thing happened. The congregation stands and one by one, they came up and embraced that missionary, hugged him and said, we love you, we forgive you, you're family. Those are amazing times. And at that time, one of our elders who's no longer here, who's moved down, it's actually Brad Schaefer, Dr. Schaefer, who's down in Arkansas. <laughs> he said, he leaned over his teenage kids and said, you need to watch this. I don't think you will ever see this happen in another church the rest of your life. That God would be that gracious for someone to be bold enough to stand up here and share their shortcomings and a church forgive them and embrace them. You see, a few years ago we did a series on altars of remembrance and I had you writing those things. I don't know if you, any of you remember that. But that's all what these things are to me. They're, they're altars of remembrance of God's greatness and this church's graciousness to allow the pastors to go a direction that we feel like God is leading us. And then lastly, again, we have visited a lot of churches. I want you to know how blessed you are to have Andrew as your worship leader. <laughs> there are not many 29-year-old people who have the sensitivity of the Holy Spirit that Andrew does. And so we are blessed here. Okay, now we're going to move on with a message. And uh, I haven't had a pre had chance to preach for 16 months. So <laughs> sit back, relax, take a nap if you need to. <laughs> we, we could be here for a while. And um, again, I've enjoyed Pastor Chris's series on Not a Fan. And I, I believe there are many people sitting in churches around the country that are fans and not really all in. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. I felt about three months ago after we began to uh, c come back to Emmanuel after and processing all the stuff we heard at the other churches where we were grieved, honestly grieved over what we were hearing. The Lord just began to put this passage in my heart and it has been brewing for about three months. And in the midst of it, God has done some things in my life and revealed some things to me that I've had to deal with. And so I'll be sharing a little bit about that as we, we go through the passage. But uh, I just want you to open your Bibles, if you will, if we can have the text up, I'd appreciate it. Open your Bibles to, you know what your destination is. You know where you're going. Let's look at, at Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 through 27. Now, honestly... There's probably three or four sermons here. So again, sit back and relax. And let's see where we go. Great passage of scripture. Enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. 
and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow is the road that leads to life. And only a few find it. Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they're ferocious wolves. And we're seeing that more and more, by the way, in the church today, okay? By their fruit, you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, and every bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. Not everyone who comes to me and says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? In your name, drive out demons and perform many miracles? Then I will say to them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who builds his house on the rock. The rain came, the streams rose, the wind blew and beat against the house. Yet, it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. Then there are those who heard, but they didn't do what they were told to do. And they were like, the foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rains came, the streams rose, the wind blew and beat against the house, and it fell with a great crash. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. And Lord, I know this is a challenging text. And Lord, it's not normally a message that's preached nowadays. And yet, Lord, I, I believe that's the word for the church today. And so, Lord, would you move among us, Lord, that your word will be the word that's spoken and not the things that I'm thinking about or saying, but it's your words that are being spoken. And, Lord, I pray that you'll stir in our hearts, as was prayed earlier, Lord, that you will stir in our hearts if you're wanting to deal with things that are there. Lord, would you reveal what only you can reveal? And, Lord, you know what each person sitting here needs today. And so would you meet those needs through your word being taught? And, Lord, have your way. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, this is the very end of the Sermon on the Mount. Greatest sermon ever preached. This is the end of it. Now, how many sermons do you hear end with a challenge like this? Because we're living in a culture that wants people to go out feeling good about themselves. Woohoo! It's all about fun. Matter of fact, one of the churches we went to, the, the sermon ended like this. When you come to know God, you have, he wants you to have fun. Telling you, dear ones, that's the kind of thing that grieved us as we visited churches. And does God want to have fun? Absolutely. That's not the primary objective, however. Okay? So, what we see there I I as we look at that is enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many find it. Dear ones, verses 13 and 14, we have two gates. Two roads, two destinations. Every one of us is on one of those roads and headed to that particular destination. Everyone is there. Everyone sitting here today, everyone walking on planet Earth is on one of those two roads heading for one of those two destinations. That's the only options. There are no other choices. And so what in the world looks like the broad way? The broad road, what, what does that look like? Well, I'll tell you what, I can tell you what the gate looks like. I don't know if you've ever been down to Memorial Stadium on football day. It looks like a tailgate party. That's the broad gate. 
Man, that is a fun place to be. I want to be a part of that. It is so inviting, and the doors are wide open. Come on in and join the party. That's the wide gate. And there's a number of significant things about people on that broad road. They typically are wanting to be happy. And if I hear any more, doesn't God want me to be happy? His goal is holiness, folks. It is always holiness. Happiness is a byproduct, not a prime product, okay? God wants holiness in our lives. But that, that broad road, it, it, it talks about happiness. It talks about it's very inviting. It looks like a lot of fun. It looks like everybody would want to go there. Why would you not want to go to where happiness is taking place? Why would you not go where all the fun is? It's, it's a well-traveled road. There's a lot of company on that road. And, and the, w- the one thing that is really interesting to me about that road is that it is not interested in the narrow road. Because it looks, and that narrow road is tough. I mean, there's, there's um, potholes in it big enough to eat up a, sharp, uh, a smart car. I mean, if you walk on a narrow road, you know what I'm talking about. It's hard. I mean, it, it's a place where you can be, get it beat up and battered. And, boy, people on the broad road, they're not interested in that at all. No, that's, that doesn't look attractive. So they want to be on that broad road. The broad road is a, is a road where people are driven by their emotions, their appetites, and their desires. And dear ones, I want you to understand, those are God-given things. But they are never intended to control our lives. And yet, that's all the broad road is about. You come, and you can do whatever you want to do. I mean, do what you want to do, when you want to do it. That's the broad road. And the broad road leads to destruction and hell. Okay? But it's a road that is so appealing. I mean, it's like uh, the, the superhighway over in, in Germany. You can just put your car on 100 and go. And this is a broad road where you can do whatever you want to do, whatever makes you happy. Go ahead. Have at it. Because that's the broad road. That's the message of the broad road. But the word says, enter through the narrow. There is one good thing about the broad road. I listened to a sermon by one of my favorite preachers, heard him live years ago, uh, African-American pastor E.V. Hill. And he says, there is one good thing about the broad road. But that broad road, boy, it is so inviting. And it sucks people in. And the problem is, the longer you stay on the broad road, the more difficult it is to get out of the broad road. Because we become callous and we become hard-hearted. Several years back, I used this. It's from a song, and Wayne Rouse told me that. But sin keeps you longer than you intended to stay. It takes you further than you intended to go, and it costs you more than you intended to pay. That's the broad road, dear ones. And people are always inviting you in, aren't they? Come on in. It's wonderful. This broad road is great, great place to be. Now, the rest of the verses, 15 through 27, are really different ways of dealing with the same issue, okay? Jesus gives illustrations there, and uh, we, we need to look at those pretty seriously. For example, be, beware, watch out for false prophets. What's, what's a false prophet? I mean, how do you know a false prophet? Well, a couple of ways is this. You've got to know the word to know them, to recognize them. So we need to be people of the word. We need to be studying the Word, reading the Word, memorizing the Word. We need to be in the Word. Other way is we need to ask God for discernment. Because as we're going to look at in, in verses 21 through 23, we're going to see that easily deceived. Easily deceived. But false prophets, let me just, just give you a couple of thoughts on that. There are typically people who come in, they look really good. They come across as holy. They come across as having it all together. And that's one of the ways you recognize them, dear ones, because when you pick up God's word, he reveals all the faults, all the junk. 
even in the leaders, doesn't he? So if you have leaders that aren't willing to share their weaknesses, their failures, false prophets, false teachers, false. A lot of times it's because of insecurity. How are people going to respond to that? The dear ones. The reality is God is very transparent with, with his people. And we need to be people of transparency. So I want to encourage you to think about discerning between what's true and what's not true. You know, one of the things that I see is, I I again, God reveals, you look at King David, adulterer, murderer, disobedient, taking a census. The thing with David is he repented. And God honored that. Okay, Or how about the, the, the prophet Jonah? Now, there's a guy who had it all together. God says, Joan, I want you to go over here. Joan says, okay. Gets swallowed by the giant fish. Doesn't say whale. It says a great fish that God prepared. Belched up on the beach. That must have been a sight and a smell. <laughs> then he goes and does what God tells him to do, and he's mad at God. Because God saved Nineveh. Now, there's a prophet that really had it all together. You see, God reveals those in his, the, the flaws and characters uh, of his great characters. One of my favorites is Habakkuk. I just love that book. Because he thinks he can really discuss with God and have a better argument than God does. Pretty interesting. God, we're really suffering here. How long is it going to be before you do something? And God says, oh, okay, I'm going to do something. You wouldn't believe it if I told you. But here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to raise up the Babylonians to discipline you. Excuse me? <laughs> that can't be right. They're worse than we are. They're a treacherous people. Why, why, they're all, are you sure you got that right? Then he makes an argument, and then he says, okay, God, I'm going I'm to wait for your response. Go ahead. Let me know. <laughs> I mean, God shows the flaws in his people. And when you have leaders who come in who aren't there, when you have prophets, pastors, teachers that come in, and they're not willing to share their, their weaknesses and their failures, dear ones, false prophets. Because, I mean, there may be two or three perfect people here, <laughs> but I've not met you yet. <laughs> and I'm certainly not. Oh, my. So we need to be open and honest about who we are, about our fall, faults and failings. If we can have the first slide up. Here's, here's some other things to look for in false prophets because it says you'll know them by their fruits. It says that twice in those few verses. By their fruits you will recognize them. So if we can have the first slide up, I'd appreciate that. But here's some of the traits of, of that, and hopefully you can read those things. We don't have time to cover all those, but pride is a big one. And honestly, dear ones, that's been one of those that God has really dealt with me on in these last few months. It, it, it's been, and, and he showed me exactly how, and it actually falls under, under a different one under. It's called fa false modesty, because I've had people say over the years, or people tell other people, and they would come up and say, one of the things I really like about you, Pastor, is you're so humble. I'm like, you know, th thank you. And then, I, then I'd be thinking about thinking, you know, I guess I am really pretty humble. <laughs> I mean, how, how terrible is that? That's awful. And God is really making that an issue in my life. Another one up there is critical. And, and I'll tell you what, when I'm with certain people, I can get really critical. And the Lord really has been dealing with this for a while, and I think I'm doing much better because my wife is helping me with that. <laughs> by my request, by the way, because we've worked this out. If she sees me going down that road of destruction with criticalness, I've told her, just give me this word, and I'll know I don't want to go there. So we've worked it out where she can give me a key word, and I can say, you know what? I don't want to live on that road of destruction that's critical. Okay? But there's other things up there. Gossip can destroy a church, and a lot of times we're so good at hiding it and, and because, I mean, Ardina, would you pray for so-and-so because this is what's going on in their life. Oh, my. <laughs> Dear ones, unless you have permission to share what you're asking for that person, just say, would you pray for so-and-so? God knows what the need is. 
And in a lot of ways, what we're doing, we're doing that is we're throwing people under the bus. And that really honors them, doesn't it? And if you've done that, you need to go ask them for forgiveness. You need to go to the person you asked to pray for them for forgiveness. Because that's a big deal. Unforgiveness is a huge one. And uh, I'll tell you what, if we operate and live in unforgiveness all the time, it turns into bitterness, which turns into destruction and a road destruction. As a matter of fact, earlier in the text, uh, not the passage I read, but it says, if you won't forgive others, God doesn't forgive you. Oh, my. That sounds like the road to destruction to me, to not walk in forgiveness. And the other thing is, if, if you're not walking in forgiveness, it's like you're drinking poison thinking they're going to die. It just doesn't make sense. But there's many things up there. Judgmental, it's easy to get there. Dominating, controlling, those are terrible places to be. And, and manipulation, and, and I'm going to tell this on Sharon, and she's okay with this. I think I didn't check, so <laughs> if I'm here next week alone or she's here, you'll know. <laughs> Boy. Um, when we first got married, Sharon would, would, would be really <laughs> sensitive. <laughs> <laughs> you hurt my feelings. <laughs> and i got to be honest, I was an idiot and clueless, like most of us guys are. But oh, lo and behold, she discovered, and I discovered, it was a way to manipulate. Because what, are, what happens, guys, when, when women cry? Oh, honey, it's okay. What can I do? How can I help? Now I just say, go ahead and cry. Because <laughs> <laughs> you learned it's just a way of manipulating and controlling. Not always, but there are times. And so... You know, you, those are roads to destruction, dear ones. They're, they're the ones who, who do that. And greediness, oh my, that is one of the great sins in America. That's gotten the mess we're in in a lot of ways. The greediness, not just of corporations, but of individuals as well. So that is a road to destruction because what does Scripture say? If we see our brother in need, we can meet that need and we don't. That is not a good thing, is it? Then a couple of other ones that we'll uh, mention. I'm not going to go through all of them. But we need to be examining ourselves. Lord, are these things in me anywhere? Are we just trying to satisfy our emotions, our appetites, our desires, our impure thoughts? And I'll tell you what, it's easy in our culture to have impure thoughts. I mean, everywhere you turn, there's garbage. But the thing I think that we're, we're looking at in our own culture now, and I don't even see it up there, but I know it's, uh, th th that it's a huge thing, and that's racism. Listen carefully. If you hate a person of a different ethnic group, that is a road to destruction and sending you to hell. Make no mistake about it. It is. Because the word says, and Jesus says, if you can't love your brother whom you have seen, you cannot love God whom you have not seen. The only way to heaven, dear ones, is to love God for sure. And if you're a part of that, in and, and, and all honesty, it's a little challenging in our culture today. And, and not maybe for the reasons you're thinking, but I'm thinking in terms of ISIS. When you see somebody from the Middle East, isn't it a little challenging? I mean, honestly, you think, are they connected? And I, I, I don't mean that, but it's just a question we have. And I understand the racism that takes place with the African Americans and white, but did you ever stop to think about the Native Americans? I mean, I, I asked James Moeller today. He was teaching years ago on Saturday morning breakfast, and he said the Americans had 350 treaties with the Native Americans. And they violated every one. Dear ones, that is a great sin. The way we have treated African Americans is a great sin. And it's not just in America. When you look at the genocide that's taking place around the world, great sin everywhere you turn and look. Racism is the road to destruction and a path directly to hell.
guarantee you that. And if you're there, you need to repent today. You can't walk out of here thinking you're, you're fine with Jesus when, you're, when you have ought against a, a, a different culture. It just won't work. You can have the next slide up, please. Roy Hessian, in his wonderful book, The Calvary Road, says this. There's only one thing in the world that can hinder a Christian's walking in victorious fellowship with God and is being filled with the Holy Spirit, and that is sin in one form or another. Sin is what keeps us from living a victorious life. Pastor Chris last week talked about pride. In, in almost every marriage, the problem is rooted in pride. Pride we've talked about a little bit already. Pride is an awful thing, and it guarantees that's the road to hell. That's, a, that's the pathway to hell. Now, verses 21 through 23. By the way, there is one really good thing about the broad road. Verses 21 through 23, an incredibly challenging text, incredibly challenging text, because, I, I mean, you think about it. Many will come to me on that day and say, Lord, Lord, do we not do this in your name? Do we not do that in your name? Do we not do miracles in your name? I mean, are those not what God wants us to do? I mean, really, Lord, signs and wonders, isn't, isn't that of you? My goodness, how, how, how can that possibly be where they hate you say, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. But, but Lord, that can't be right. So, 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 so what's the deal there? Did you, did you notice the very beginning of that? Did we not cast out demons? Did we? Who is it that actually cast out demons? Who is it? Jesus. Who is it that actually performs miracles? Who is it that actually prophesies? Using us as instruments, but dear ones, it is never about us. It's always about him. And when we say, well, I did this or I did that, we are stealing God's glory and we have to recognize we can do nothing. John 15 says, without him, we can do nothing. So it's all about him and his glory, and he will not share it with us. And so you have people here who think they're just fine. They think they're just walking with Jesus and having a wonderful time and doing what he wants. And obviously he wants those things. Why? Because he honors his name. He will always honor his name, dear ones, because his name is power, more powerful than any name on in heaven or earth. It always is. I mean, it's at his name that every knee will bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord. So you've got these people here who think they're just fine. They're on the broad road, and they don't know it. They simply don't know it. I mean, that's a scary place to be. But let me give you another person there. Did you ever hear of a guy named Judas? He was at every meeting. Every time the church, church, church doors were open, Judas was there. Oh, oh, because he's one of the twelve. He saw all the miracles. He watched everything Jesus did. He heard all that Jesus taught. But when he was not with the twelve, he was pilfering through the money because he was the treasurer. And he was making deals with the priest to turn Jesus over. You see, he was never on the narrow road. He was always on the broad road, no matter what he looked like. No matter what he was doing, he was on the broad road. And I can't help but wonder how many people are sitting in churches in America today who are on the broad road who think they're doing just fine. <coughs> Excuse me. You see, What's your destination? Are you on the broad road? You may think you're on the narrow road, but are you on the broad road? We want to talk about that a little bit more because there is one good thing about the broad road. If we move on down then to the next passage about building your house. Build it on a firm foundation, you build it on sand. It's interesting because both parties listened and heard 
what Jesus said. They listened and they heard. The one man walked in obedience and built it the way Jesus said. The other man built his like he wanted to build it. He listened, he heard, and I believe this is where a lot of people are who are sitting in church. It just actually came out in prayer meeting. Hmm, I like that. Hmm. Jesus, you say you're with me always, even to the end of the day. I like that. I'll, I'll build my house on that part of that foundation. Jesus, you, you, you say you died for my sins and are forgiven. I, I, I like that part of it. I'll, I'll build my house on that foundation. And, and Jesus say, hmm, your, 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 your birds are easy and light. I, I like that part of the foundation. I, I, I like that. So I'm building my house on those things. You see, we pick and choose what we want to believe and what we want to hold on to as our foundation. That is not the gospel of Jesus Christ. You're either all in or you're not in at all. Now, now understand, as we walk our journey, we get more and more understanding and more and more revelation of how sinful we are in light of his great holiness. Thank you, Troy. In light of God's holiness, we get more and more understanding of that. And he continues to work in our life to, reform, uh, to conform us and do that. On the back of your bulletin, if you've got your bulletin, if you'll pull that out, there's a couple of statements in there by a guy named Mark Batterson who's written a book called All In. It says, I'm afraid we've cheapened the gospel by buying in without selling out. And I think that's where much of the church is today. We pray this simple, easy gospel. I call it sloppy grace. And we bought into that, and we're letting people think they're all right, when reality is that's the broad road that's leading them right to hell. The other quote that's on there I like as well. We've just enough Jesus to be informed, but not enough to be transformed. You see, when we have a real encounter with Jesus Christ, he comes into our life, and he makes radical changes. We can't just keep, keep doing a lot. You can't do that, dear ones. He begins to make changes in our life. And one of the ways you begin to identify the fruit is what changes has it made in people's lives. What's different about them now than what used to be? And I, when, I, when I committed my life to Christ at 16 years old, I was a foul-mouthed, conceited jerk. Of course, I didn't know it at the time. But the reality is, that's what I was. And the first thing God took from me was my foul mouth. And I, I am appalled in the last 20 years of the language I hear coming out of Christians' mouths. It ought not to be. James 3.10 says, blessings and cursings ought not to be coming from the same mouth. Should not happen. And, and Christians are throwing profanity around just like the world does and think they're fine. I'm telling you, that's the broad road that leads to destruction. And I guarantee you this, the non-believers know that's wrong. So you're trying to impress them and be connected with them, but the reality is it's the broad road. As a matter of fact, James also says to be friends with the world is to hate God. Or John, John 16, 2 says that. That's a strong word, but that's the reality of the broad road versus the narrow road. You see, when, when, it, when they're building the house, I, I just can't help but think, how many times do you hear people say, well, I believe in God? You know what a great follow-up question is? What kind of God do you believe in? Because they won't have a clue. I remember in college, and this is another thing God has convicted me on in these last few months that I've been praying about this. I've lost my first love. And I love Jesus, that's not it. But when, when the Lord really got a hold of my life as a, as a teenager, I loved evangelism. I mean, I'd be inviting people to church and, and stuff as a kid, didn't know what. And then in college, had three of us that would go out to the park and one would play the guitar and sing, that wasn't me. But then the, the other two of us would just share, try to share the gospel to people gathering around to listen. And I've lost that. I haven't done that. My life has been so wrapped up with Christians and church life, I just lost that passion. 
And I'm asking the Lord, Lord, would you give me that back? Would you bring that back into my life? I mean, I love the opportunity I have when I have opportunity to share step up to life and, and to teach step up to life. But it's, it's not the same as, as rubbing elbows with people on a regular basis sharing the gospel. It's just not the same. And the other thing I've lost, and it's just been lately, and I'm just recognizing as I'm going through this, I, I, I've lost, I don't want to say the love of teaching the word, but I've lost the opportunity to do that. I'm asking the Lord, where do I begin to do that again? Do I do a study in our home? Do I do it in a church somewhere? But I know I need to get back to, to having the word shared with people. I've got to get back to that. So when God, when God begins to move on our hearts and show us things, dear ones, we need to respond to that. Now, let's move in to the narrow road and what that looks like. By the way, there is one good thing about the broad road. Are you ready to know what that is? It's broad enough to turn around and get out. <laughs> we don't have to stay on that broad road. That turning around is called repentance. And interestingly enough, repentance, I believe, is a small gate that gets us in to the narrow way. We come in because Jesus says in Mark 1, 15, enter by, actually, John, uh, Matt, uh, Jesus saying that in, in Matthew, but in Mark 1, 15, he says, repent and believe. That's the gate that gets us through to the narrow road. And what does that narrow road look like? I mean, that's, that's the challenge for every believer. What does that narrow road look like? And I want you to look at this today and find out, make a decision, what's your destination and what road are you on? Because I'm going to give opportunity a little bit later, if you're on the broad road, to give you opportunity to get out of there and get on the narrow road, okay? What does the narrow road look like? If we can have up the next slide, I would appreciate it. The narrow road, I listed verses up there, and I'm going to cover those real quickly, too, much, too little space for everything. But in, in the passage we're looking at in, in 7, it says, when, when Jesus is talking, he says, he who obeys, okay? When you look at, at the verse, and they said, and Jesus says, many will come to me and say, Lord, Lord, and he said, no, no, only he who obeys my Father who's in heaven. That's the narrow way. It's a walk of obedience to Christ Jesus, okay? A little bit later, verse 24, it says, he who listens and does what he's told to do. Obedience, he who listens. Another verse we're going to look at here. And it, and it says this in um, Luke 29 or 9, 23. If anyone will deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. So there's a dying to self, a denial of self. Lord, I'm not going to go down that road anymore. Recognizing that we're dead. When, when I, I preached several years back in a church in Phoenix, and I could tell a guy came up and wanted to talk, and he's, I could just tell he's kind of a little bit argumentative. And he, he's like, what, what's your opinion about that? And I, and I thought for a second, I said, are dead men supposed to have opinions? He's like, what? Well, we've died to ourselves, Right? Died to ourselves. I shouldn't have an opinion about that. Now, we do have opinions. But I could tell he's wanting to argue over something, and I didn't want to go to an argument. So, but I've got to recognize, isn't that true? We do need to take up our cross daily and follow him. Verse 20 in that same, uh, in uh, John chapter, or 19 in John chapter 15 says, the narrow road, the world will hate you. Verse 20 of the same chapter says, the world will persecute you. Do you see the chug holes coming here? You see the speed bumps down the narrow road? You see why people don't want to go down the narrow road? Even though it is the road that leads to life and to heaven, people prefer the broad road. Look at uh, John chapter 16, verse 2. It says, a time is coming when anyone who kills you will think they're doing a service for God. Dear ones, the narrow road 
is a difficult road. It's a hard road to walk, but it is the road that leads to life and heaven. Philippians 1.27 says, Conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. Is your life being lived in a manner worthy of the gospel? You know, the one, the, one of the things that I think is, is, is interesting is one of the things for a false prophet is his life away from the platform should match his life on the platform. Every one of you here, if you claim to be a Christian, the way you act at home should be no different than the way you act on a Sunday morning. That life needs to be consistent to be on the narrow road. It has to be. Otherwise, it's a hypocrite, and hypocrisy leads down the broad road that leads to hell. Now, another thing, Colossians 2.6 says, As you've received Christ Jesus the Lord, walk in him. What does that look like to walk in him? We're going to talk about that in just a minute. But I want you to know, there is no middle road. There's two roads. Francis Chan, pastor, used to pastor a church, big church in the Simi Valley, said people had come up with, um, to him who had been with him from the very beginning, and they said, Francis, you don't get it. You keep talking about the narrow road. There are many of us who are on a middle road. We come, we serve, we give, we love being involved, and we're comfortable. And we are on that middle road. And he said, isn't that interesting? Because the Bible says there's two roads. I'm telling you, if you're one of those who think you're on the middle road, you are on the narrow road. Or you're on the broad road, and you're leaning up against the barrier to the narrow road, but you can't cross over over the barrier. The only way out is to repent and turn and come back around to the narrow gate. <coughs> What does it mean to be in Christ? If we can have that next slide up, I'd appreciate that. Thank you. Watchman Nee, a great Chinese Christian, spent years in prison in China, says this. New birth is a reception of a life which I did not possess before. It's not that my natural life has been changed at all. <coughs> it's another life altogether new, altogether divine, which has become my life. Let me see if I can illustrate that. Before I came to Christ Jesus, before I came to the cross, okay, I could work hard, I could try, I began to recognize things in my life I didn't like, I can make those changes, I can do all that stuff, but it doesn't get me to the cross. What gets me to the cross is recognizing that I'm a sinner and I need a Savior. When I get to that point, I repent and say, Lord Jesus, come in and take over my life, which gets me to the cross. Okay? Then I begin to understand I couldn't get, save myself, but I'm at the cross, and here's what I did for many years, and it was wrong. I tried my best to live a good Christian life. I tried working harder. I tried recognizing. I got involved teaching. I got involved doing all kinds of things. But it was still difficult at best because I kept falling and being frustrated because I wasn't succeeding in my Christian journey the way I should have. Because I didn't understand the transaction that took place at the cross. The transaction is this. When I come to the cross... The life of Christ Jesus comes to live in me by his Holy Spirit. That's why Paul can say, it is no longer I who live because Christ lives in me. I failed to recognize because I wasn't taught that when I went to the cross, I was crucified with him. Amen? Romans 6 talks about it. Galatians 2.20 talks about it. And so my life is dead on the cross. And it's the life of Christ Jesus living in me that empowers me to walk. And it's his life living in me and through me on this side of the cross. I couldn't say myself on this side. I can't live the Christian life on this side on my own strength. It is his very life living in me. That's what that quote is really all about. If we can have the last slide, then we'll close with this. I believe we all need to pray this prayer on a regular basis. 
Lord, Lord, search my heart, O oh God. Test me. Test me. How many of us ever ask God to test us? One thing I know, and Sharon shared this, has shared this many times. She asked God to show her heart years ago. And he did, and she, she was glad that he did, but she was not happy. And I believe that's true for all of us. If we truly ask God to show us our hearts, Lord, what's in there that you want to deal with? And he's been doing with that, and I've shared some of those things today. He's been doing that with me for the last few months. And I'll tell you what, it's not pleasant because you recognize, boy, without him, I'm a mess. It may look like a cleaned up mess. You see, that, that, that's, when you go back to, to verses 21, or, or um, yeah, 21 through 23, that's the issue. They look good. They thought they were okay. But signs and wonders are not evidence of a life that's on the narrow road. We all want to see signs and wonders. We all want that. But more than anything, we want to have people on the narrow road because signs and wonders are going to be counterfeited big time as we get closer to the Lord's coming. Yes, and we have seen signs and wonders in this place many times over. As a matter of fact, there's a group here that prays on Tuesday nights, and they pray for, for miracles, and God brings them. But dear ones, it is not about signs and wonders. It's about where's our focus, and it has to be on Jesus and recognizing that he and he alone is the one who pro provides our life because he is our life. And if he's not, you're on the wrong road. Deuteronomy 30, 19 through 20. This day I call heaven and earth as witness against you that I have set before you life and death, blessings and cursings. You choose life so that you and your children may live and love the Lord your God. Listen to his voice. Hold fast to him. For he, the Lord, is our life. Is the Lord your life today as Andrew comes? Is the Lord your life today? Do you know which road you're on? Did you identify with any of those things on the broad road? I'm going to ask you to do something. I'm going to pray and then ask you to do something as Andrew leads us in a song. What I'm going to ask you to do you know, it, it's, it's easy in our culture to try to make things as easy as we can because that's what we want. We, we like that soft, comfortable road. But today, if you've identified any of those things in your life that's on the broad road, I'm going to ask you to step out in the aisle when we start to sing and come forward. And the prayer teams will be up here to pray with you because, dear ones, there's no greater place to be than on the narrow road. No greater place to be. A few years back at a Southern Baptist convention, one of the leaders stood up and shared this statistic. <clears throat> he said, Southern Baptists are known for evangelism. And he said, I would venture to say not more than 10% of the people sitting in our churches are actually born again. They look good. They look the part. They may do signs and wonders. But the reality is they're on the broad road. They may be bumping up against the barrier between the narrow road and the broad road, but they're on the narrow road. And I believe that, that number is accurate in American churches all over. Why? Because we can tell by the fruit. And when you hear fruit that Troy shared, 60% are texting, or sexting. When you, when you hear reports about Christian um, conferences and stuff and, and the men that are watching pornography in their rooms away from their homes, dear ones, there's many on the broad road who are sitting in our churches. If you're one of those today, I don't want you to be embarrassed because we're not ashamed of the gospel. We need to step out because I guarantee it, this place is an amazingly loving place, full of grace, full of mercy, and no judgment. And I want to invite you today to say, Lord, I want to be totally in on that narrow road. Let's pray, and then Andrew will lead us a song, and the prayer teams can come forward, and people, I'm going to ask you to come and pray. Don't miss this opportunity. And I, I, have a, I just think there's somebody here that's dealing with racism, and you need to deal with it today. Today is your day to be free. Father God, I want to come to you and say thank you, Father. I want to thank you for this opportunity to share your word. 
Now, Lord, I thank you that somehow or other the things that were said were the things that needed to be said, even though I had much more in notes and thoughts. Lord, you, you did it, and I'm grateful that you were able to do that. So I just bless you, and I pray, Lord, that for each one of us here, that our hearts were touched today, Lord, as we examine ourselves, as we say, test us, O oh God, because, Lord, we don't want there to be anything impure in us. So would you move on those, Lord, right now who need to respond to the message? In Jesus' name, amen. Christ is my reward and all of my devotion. Now there's nothing in this world that could ever satisfy. Through every trial, my soul will sing, no turning back. I've been set free. if you're on that narrow road, it doesn't mean we don't occasionally slip and have some of those issues in our life. The narrow road, though, you can't stay there. Those sins bother you, and you want to get off of that stuff quickly. The problem is, when you're on the broad road, it takes time, it takes energy, because it takes a while to produce fruit. It doesn't happen overnight. And the longer we stay on that, the more difficult it is to repent and turn around. But we all have stuff that comes up that's on the broad road. And the key is we don't keep, we don't hold on to it. We let it go. The other thing is for those who are picking and choosing what they want and building their house, when the storms come, the crash will come. So I want to encourage you to come. Come and pray. God's wanting to set you free today. And sometimes that freedom is not coming through prayer, but it comes through renouncing and, per and repenting. There's things we just want to ask God, okay, God, just take it. Sometimes we need to renounce what got us there and repent from participating in it and opening the door. That's what God's wanting. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. Decided to follow Jesus, no turning back, no turning back. The cross before me, the world behind me, no turning back, no turning back. The cross before me, the world behind me, no turning back. Turning back, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back, no turning back, no turning. Back. No turn turning back, no turning back. 
Dear ones, we'll be around here afterwards if you need to talk or pray, but there are some who should have responded today that didn't. I just feel it in my spirit. And I'm sad because God is wanting a special relationship. He's wanting a special encounter with you. And you're saying you're not interested. So, Lord, would you move in their hearts? And if they walk out here today, Lord, I pray they will have a miserable week. Absolutely miserable. Because they haven't done business with you when you've been calling them. I thank you, Lord, that there are many who have found in a narrow way. But I pray, Lord, you'll reveal to those who leave here today who are still on the Broadway the seriousness of that decision. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a wonderful day. You're dismissed. Brother, how are you? Well, good morning, Emmanuel Fellowship. Isn't it a good morning to be in the house of God to come together and worship Him this morning? Amen? Amen. Why don't you stand with us this morning as we worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? Living for everything. 